Gilmore. Uh, this is the only board meeting that we have on the agenda for today. So without any further ado, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the first order of business will be to approve the agenda. Is there any objection to the agenda as provided? Were there any additions? Seeing no additions and no objections, the agenda is approved as written. Our next order of business this morning will be to approve the proceedings from the February 5th, 2015 board meeting. Is there any objection to approving those proceedings as written? Seeing none, those proceedings are approved as written. Our next order of business this morning will be for public comment for any items that are not on the agenda. We do not have anyone signed up to speak. I does not appear anyone from the audience is running to get to the microphone. We did receive one item that are in uh, the supplemental materials. Uh, and Melissa will just briefly go over that item of public comment that was received prior to the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we did receive a letter from a recreational fisherman uh, in the Delmarva region, and he wanted to provide um, some of his experience on the water um, about how they are seeing a lot fewer tog in spots that are known to have to tog in the water. So um, please see his comments, um, his letter that is included in the supplemental materials. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Melissa on that? All right, seeing none, we will move on to the meat and potatoes of today's meeting. Uh, we will need to consider a management response to the benchmark stock assessment, and leading up to that, we will get a technical committee report to get some more feedback on the stock unit definitions that we had reviewed at the last meeting. And for that, I will turn to Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jason McNamee. I work for the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I'm going to go through a slide presentation. There are a few slides. I think a lot of them will be kind of a quick flip through. So hopefully this won't take too long. I don't want to eat into your discussion time. But this is a report from the Tatog Technical Committee, and it focuses in on the regional breakout uh, and the biological reference points from the stock assessment. So uh, just by way of introduction, in February, uh, this board approved the 2015 benchmark stock assessment and peer review reports for uh, the Tatog stock, um, and they approved this for management use. However, at that time, there was uh, a lot of discussion on the uh, regional breakouts as well as the biological reference points. So uh, this board tabled that uh, section of the uh, report for further discussion. So the technical committee met, um, I believe it was in March, and uh, we developed a report that kind of splits out the regional uh, information as well as the biological reference point information um, so that we could kind of focus in on that. So this presentation will explain the uh, biological and fisheries data used to weigh the strengths and weaknesses of the four stock unit definitions. So there are four. We looked at uh, coastwide, we looked at a two region breakout, and then we looked at two different three region breakouts and we'll um, hit on all of those. Uh, at some point during this presentation. Uh, it also presents some additional MRIP data analysis that was completed after the assessment occurred, and we'll uh, touch on that as well. Uh, and then we'll finish up with a look at the overfished and overfishing status um, for the different regions based on biological reference points as well. All right, so I'm going to start off with a discussion about the regions. The technical committee considered all available biological and fisheries data as well as management concerns when determining the regional definitions to assess. So we looked at um, a whole suite of information during our deliberations during the, the stock assessment process. 
Based on the analyses of biological and fisheries information, the technical committee determined that the coastwide stock unit was not appropriate, and, and that's what we had been managing with more or less uh, to that point um, was a coastwide unit. So we wanted to get away from that. We felt it was not appropriate for it to talk. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that we kind of had as underlying principles were that the appropriate region designations must compromise both Tatog's limited home range so they don't move very far. They kind of come back to the same areas year after year. With the available data that we had, as well as uh, political boundaries, so it's sometimes very difficult to manage things outside of the, the state breakout that um, we currently have set up. So the technical committee uh, recognized that the proposed three region breakdowns that they, they aren't perfect. They likely contain distinct sub-stocks, sub but we believe that this structure reduces the risk of overfishing any individual sub-stock and is better uh, in any regard than the previous coastwide structure that we were using. So we considered two different three region uh, breakouts. The first was the base model breakout that had a southern New England region that had uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts all in it. There was a, uh, I guess I'll call it a, an upper mid-Atlantic New York, New Jersey region, and then a Delmarva uh, region that included Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. We also looked at an, an alternate region, and so for the most northern region, that will comprise just Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, there's a mid-Atlantic group that has Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, and then a southern group that, uh, again, is the Delmarva region, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Uh, the, the Delmarva region doesn't change in either of the, those two situations. And one additional note, um, Massachusetts and Rhode Island up to this point had been managing using a separate standalone um, stock assessment. So this um, is that, at least that northern region, is in line with that stock unit. Some uh, notes on the regions. New York and New Jersey share a fishery south of Long Island. Um, and it is very difficult to distinguish catches um, from this area from each other. Um, Biological evidence suggests that Connecticut and New York fish from, from Long Island Sound are more similar to southern New England fish than to New Jersey fish. And the technical committee believed Connecticut would have a higher degree of connectivity with Massachusetts and Rhode Island than it would with New Jersey. So these are all um, pieces of information that we weighed <coughs> in our deliberations. Um, and so the technical committee initially, based on a lot of this information, chose the base model as the preferred regional configuration which grouped Connecticut with Massachusetts and Rhode Island into a southern New England region. So I'm going to dig into this uh, a little bit more. <clears throat> At the time, the technical committee expressed concern that this preferred regionalization splits Long Island Sound into two stocks. Uh, and that the data sets contain both Connecticut and New York fish. Um, therefore, we looked at a what we called a highly regarded alternate regional breakdown, and this grouped Connecticut with New York and New Jersey. And we looked at that in a pretty um, in a pretty detailed way as well. So I'm just going to pause for a minute here and. <clears throat> I was at the, the last board meeting and I, I listened to the deliberations and it, it was very similar, just so you know, to deliberations that we had at the technical committee. It wasn't, it was by no means a slam dunk to go with the, what we ended up calling our preferred regional breakout. We had a lot of discussion. We had multiple meetings on it. It was a, a vigorous yet respectful debate that we had at the technical committee. So I, I just wanted to make you aware that it wasn't just a, an item of discussion for you. We also discussed this at length at the, at the technical committee. 
Um, <clears throat> a two-region breakdown, uh, Massachusetts through New York, and then New Jersey through North Carolina, and a coast-wide model were also considered. However, the technical committee determined that the finer scale that the three regional breakdown gave uh, was preferred and was the better breakout to use for status and uh, management information. Um, and again, an important note, both the preferred and the alternate highly regarded three region definitions, they were uh, both presented and both were supported for management use by the technical committee and the peer review panel. So that was <clears throat> at the technical committee, we always strive to, to achieve a, a consensus. And so the way we, as I just mentioned, there was a vigorous debate that we had over uh, how to, to make these three region breakouts work. And uh, in the end, the way we came to consensus was to call one preferred and to call one highly regarded. So um, I, I know some folks have chuckled at the kind of the language we use there, but it, it was intentional and it was how we kind of got through the, the struggle that we were having. So now I'm gonna dig into um, the specific information that we were looking at when we made our, our decisions on the regional breakout. Um, the first suite of information we looked at was biological information. There were several key biological characteristics that we examined to make inferences about similarities between the areas. Uh, and these included age and length data, collected by each state, which we use to look at growth. Uh, natural mortality, uh, we looked at um, estimators for natural mortality from the scientific literature and then compared the different areas um, with those estimators. And then we looked at uh, migratory behaviors based on tagging studies um, conducted by state programs. It's important to note that the data availability, it varies pretty significantly by region. The northern states have more data, in particular from early in the time series when there were more older, larger fish uh, in the samples. The southern states lack data from fishery independent sources uh, and therefore have lim limited samples of the youngest, smallest fish. You would get those fish from fishery independent information, you can't get those from um, commercial sampling or recreational sampling because it's not legal to keep those very small fish. Um, the New York samples come from both Long Island Sound and the Atlantic Ocean, which makes uh, the distinctions between the New York and New Jersey growth rates less certain. So the data there are almost certainly uh, confounded. <clears throat> Further examination of uh, growth rate differences should be explored using data that are more representative of the full size age structure of the population. So this is just a kind of a recommendation of something that we need to be cognizant of moving forward that as we gain more information as our sampling program continues through time, we should re-examine uh, this information. So um, the first piece of information uh, biological information that I mentioned were these growth curves. So growth curves per state and region were developed using length and age data. And so what these were, were an examination of von Bergelamfy growth curves. Um, so your maximum size, that's uh, like your L infinity parameter and then the growth constant, that's your K parameter from the von Bert um, equation. And what we found was that growth constants generally decreased along the north to south uh, gradient, while maximum sizes were higher in the southern portion of the range than the northern <coughs> portion of the range. And so this suggests uh, a regional difference in growth sizes. And just to kind of hone you in, Mike, if you'll kind of click, um, you can see this first grouping here. For the growth constants, there's similarities. In that grouping, if you click again, Mike, you can see um, there's also similarities uh, in this grouping of the growth constant. And then one more click, Mike, and you can see there's this general trend. It's not um, ex an exact trend by any means, but you can see that the max size estimates uh, go from low to high moving nor uh, north to south. Um, you can also see this in the, the more truncated version with the 
in, in particular the three region breakout. So Mike, if you um, click, you can see we go from low to high again in that max size estimate. And then uh, click one more time, Mike, and you can see again, there's a grouping here with the growth constant in the Von Burt curve information. <coughs> Another piece of information we looked at was natural mortality. We calculated natural mortality for each region. Um, area specific estimates showed higher rates of natural mortality in the northern regions relative to the southern regions. So these higher estimates of M for the northern regions came from estimators that rely on growth parameters. So we looked at a whole suite, we did a pretty thorough examination of all the different techniques for examining natural mortality. Um, and so the ones that looked at growth parameters showed this um, difference between northern and southern areas. And uh, Mike, if you go ahead and click twice, you can see the southern New England area had a higher level while there was a lower natural mortality in the southern extent of the range. Um, however, the estimators that relied on longevity data rather than the, the growth parameters, they were more similar for natural mortality than, um, than these would indicate. Okay, the final piece of biological information is uh, migratory behavior. Um, and so we inferred migration from tagging data. And what this indicated was that Tatog have strong site fidelity and move only short distances longitudinally, if at all, during their seasonal migrations. Now that statement certainly depends on where you are. Um, and the tagging data can be somewhat misleading that to talk move they they move in and out uh, depending on where you are in the range however they tend to come back um, to the same areas year after year so just to orient you to this plot that's up um, you can see there's a couple of uh, marathon to talk there that um, those blue dots that are kind of up away from the rest of the grouping uh, those are certainly outliers but in general, on the y-axis, you have distance in miles, and along the x-axis, you have days at large. So this is um, the time from when the fish was tagged to when it was uh, intercepted. And you can see the vast majority of the data is grouped down within 10 miles of where they were tagged is where they are picked back up. So um, they're, they're sticking around close to home and, and don't move that far. So the migration information is strong evidence for managing to talk at a finer regional scale. And this further justifies that the current, or what was in place, um, coastwide stock unit is not appropriate based on the limited home range for this uh, reef oriented species. So now we're gonna move away from the biological information and talk a little bit about the fishery information. So fishery dependent data uh, examined during the assessment included recreational and commercial vessel trip reports. So um, commercial vessel trip reports, um, you know, that's a little more obvious, but the VTR data that we looked at for the recreational side is from the party and charter fleet, and these are federally permitted party and charter vessels. Um, the fishery catch and effort information from the National Marine Fishery Service VTR data was evaluated by stat area to identify state specific characteristics. So again, uh, these data, they're a subset of the fishery. Uh, they therefore may not be fully representative, but we thought that, that it was worth looking at because it has a lot more definition in it than the MRIP data has, at least by way of they have statistical areas recorded. So we can kind of take a look at that. Um, and get a, a better sense of where the harvest is coming from for these different fishery sectors. The results indicated that angler effort from Massachusetts to Connecticut remained primarily within local sounds and bays. Uh, the same effort from Delaware to Virginia remains south of Delaware Bay. And that the fisheries in New York and New Jersey range from Long Island Sound to Delaware Bay but they have significant overlap in ocean waters in stat areas 612 and 613. 
Uh, and this is approximately uh, Manasquan River, New Jersey to Montauk, New York. Um, and so we've got uh, a little more information. We'll show you a map of where these stat areas are um, right now, actually. It was the next slide. So you're looking at um, a couple of tables here, plus the statistical areas off on the right-hand side. Um, and I'll have you focus in, uh, the top is the commercial information, the top table. The bottom table is the recreational information. Uh, the far left-hand side of the table is the statistical areas. And so what you can do is look at the statistical area and then look over at the map if you can even read those numbers. Hey, I'll, I'll use the, the fancy laser pointer I have here and try and focus you in on a couple of things and I'll try not to laser beam Katie or, or Mike in the process. Um, but what you can see, uh, Massachusetts has uh, fisheries in both Cape Cod Bay and then uh, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard Sounds. Rhode Island um, tends to be in uh, Block Island and Rhode Island Sounds. But then you get into this Connecticut, New York, New Jersey area and what you can see in these tables is Whoops. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. A lot of overlap. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So you get the slug of, of red in the middle here. So you can see Connecticut and New York uh, in stat area 611. There's a lot of overlap there. And then New York and New Jersey have a lot of overlap in 612. 611 is Long Island Sound, and 612 is on the other side of Long Island Sound, sort of in the, um, the nexus there between Long Island and New Jersey. So you can see there's a lot of overlap um, with kind of New York in the middle of this overlap. And then as you head down south, um, there's overlap in stat area 621 between Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, significant overlap. And this bears out to, to different degrees, but is similar uh, in both the commercial and the recreational data. So the patterns of fishing effort inferred from the VTR data suggests New Jersey and New York are fishing on the same fish in the ocean south of Long Island and that New York and Connecticut are fishing on the same fish in Long Island Sound, while Connecticut and New Jersey have very minimal overlap. So given the overlap of fishing effort between New York and New Jersey in the ocean waters, the technical committee chose to include New York and New Jersey in the same region. We thought it was important um, because of the amount of overlap between those two states uh, that we keep them together. The New York and Connecticut fishing effort also overlaps. Uh, this is extremely significant in Long Island Sound. Uh, and this is why we struggled with this. And um, it's why the technical committee also strongly endorsed the inclusion of Connecticut um, in that New York, New Jersey region um, and preferred the, the three region breakdown in general over separating New York and New Jersey into northern and southern regions. Okay, so a little bit uh, more fishery information came forward after uh, you all met in February. Um, there was a uh, request from one of the commissioners to look into the MREP data, and, and he had his staff uh, really dig into the MREP and to try and glean the information that they could from that data set. So the data from Rhode Island through New Jersey were evaluated, and what they did was they evaluated the MREP data summarizing the harvest and catch by state, site, fishing area, and distance from shore. So these are all data elements that are included in the MREP data set. Uh, look, and they looked at the years 2004 through 2014, so about 10 years worth of data. Uh, and what you see is it showed a similar pattern to what we saw with the VTR data with Rhode Island catch coming from mainly from Narragansett Bay. This is the uh, recreational fishery, so I sh probably should have started with the vast majority of the harvest in Tatog is from the recreational sector. The commercial is um, sometimes as little as 10% of the, the harvest, so uh, the recreational information is extremely important. Um, so Rhode Island data is coming mainly from Narragansett Bay, 
Connecticut. Uh, catch is coming um, pretty much exclusively from Long Island Sound. And then New Jersey catch is coming from open water. And then New York is split between the two. So it has a lot coming out of Long Island Sound and it has a lot coming out of the open water area. So again, this overlap, um, it's the, the uniqueness of New York with Long Island Sound that kind of leads to this very um, distinct fishery. Okay, so now I'm going to move into um, some of the peer review comments on this information. We thought we'd split those out just to remind you about this. The peer review panel downweighted the biological information in assessing regions, so there was a lot of discussion at your February board meeting about this ad hoc approach to the regions, and I felt it was a little unfair. We did a lot of work. I, I would refer to it more as a weight of evidence analysis rather than ad hoc. Um, but the reason I think um, the peer review panel chair characterized it that way is because they downweighted the biological information. They basically stated that the regional differences could be driven as much by data availability and differences in that availability um, as the rather than the statistics bearing out actual differences. Um, and it's a, a very logical and, and um, important note to make. Um, in addition, they approved finer regional scale assessments. So they also agreed with our interpretation that fewer, uh, the, the more regions, the better. Um, so they agreed with that, and they stated that the region level um, ASAP assessment, so this is the statistical catch at age assessment that we put forward as the preferred method, that this uh, region level ASAP provided the best available scientific foundation for management. Um, and it's also important to note that they did not endorse one regional uh, breakdown over another, meaning they didn't give any guidance as far as uh, which three region breakout they thought was better uh, than the other. So I got a couple um, slides here concluding um, the regional discussion. So the TATOG Technical Committee determined a three region approach would provide the best balance between a smaller geographical scale and the data available, the richness and the reliability of that information. Um, we also considered both three region breakdowns to be reasonable from a scientific standpoint. Um, we will note that the highly regarded three region breakdown avoids um, the Long Island Sound mismatch, so it, it doesn't split Long Island Sound into two. A couple of additional notes. Long Island Sound presents a unique challenge uh, to regional management for this species. That population in Long Island Sound probably represents a substock, um, and that substock most likely only has a small amount of overlap and recruitment with uh, surrounding areas. Uh, there's a genetic study taking place. Um, I believe this is referring to the study out of uh, the Virginia Institute, Institute of Marine Science. And this study may help inform the, that assumption that Long Island Sound has a distinct substock. One other very important note is that in recent years, harvest from Long Island Sound has accounted for 29% of the coastwide landing, so that harvest is significant and is an important consideration for the board. So for these regions, the technical committee acknowledges managing Long Island Sound as a discrete area may be appropriate. Um, so that means a Long Island Sound specific um, <coughs> assessment would be needed um, in that case. Um, fishery independent data exists for Long Island Sound. All of Connecticut's sampling and most of New York's fishery independent surveys for Tatog come from the Sound, so there's a, a decent amount of information um, within the Sound itself. But there are challenges with properly partitioning the fishery dependent data and harvest estimates for Long Island Sound, especially for New York's harvest. Um, these challenges at the time prohibited us from exploring a Long Island Sound specific assessment. That's why we, we didn't do it um, for the current benchmark, but we do recognize the value in exploring this option in the future. 
Okay, so that's it on the regions, and I'm going to finish up here with a couple slides on the biological reference point. So this was another um, element from the uh, assessment information that came up at your board meeting. Um, we had developed different biological reference points for the, the three regions that we had put forward as our preferred regions. So just a quick upfront statement. The technical committee felt that since we were um, e each of the the subregions that we assessed, they're separate assessments. So we were comfortable that we had the flexibility to develop individual inconsistent biological reference points because the information contained in each of the um, regional assessments is different. And so I'll I'll outline um, the logic that we kind of followed uh, in these slides. Uh, there's only a few more left. So uh, longer data time series exist for states in the north. Therefore, the assessment used different methods to calculate the reference points for these different regions. Um, the ASAP model, using the ASAP model uh, as our preferred um, tool, we developed maximum sustainable yield based reference points. Um, they used a combination of spawning potential ratio, uh, SPR, yield per recruit, and we also use the stock recruit relationship to calculate spawning stock biomass of uh, maximum sustainable yield and fishing mortality of maximum sustainable yield. The MSY based reference points were proposed for the southern New England region mainly due to the longer time series of data. So there were two things in play for the southern New England assessment. We had a reasonably estimated spawner recruit relationship that the model produced. Um, and we had data back to when the stock was believed to be at a high level. So the southern New England information goes all the way back to the uh, early 80s. SPR-based reference points were proposed for the New York through New Jersey and the Delmarva regions because of the shorter time series of data. So if you go back and review the assessments for those two areas, they have a shorter time series. Um, for the Delmarva spawner recruit curve, it, it was an easy choice. Um, the model produced unrealistic parameters, uh, the recruit um, spawner recruit relationship at a steepness equal to one. So there, there's no relationship there. The spawner recruit curve for the New York, New Jersey region provided more reasonable parameter estimates, but we didn't uh, use it because the data used in the assessment did not include the peak of the population abundance at the beginning of the recreational time series. So it didn't have that very um, high population abundance we believe was there in the early part of the time series. And the curve uh, that was produced by the model was sensitive to the assumptions, uh, in particular about the population levels at the beginning of the time series. So with the statistical models, you put in a, a vector of your first year population. And what we found is the curve would change depending on what, our, um, what we populated that vector with um, for each of the runs. Uh, MSY-based reference points are generally preferred when they are considered reliable, uh, mainly because they address stock productivity by taking into account the relationship between spawning stock biomass and future recruitment. Um, SPR-based reference points don't, don't do this. The technical committee recognizes that there still could be significant uncertainty in the spawner recruit data for the New England region. Um, for instance, the MSY, the FMSY reference point, it could change in the future uh, as a result as you add more information in. So um, we acknowledge this uh, certainly. But at this time, the uh, biological reference point selections of the technical committee are the best scientific information that we have available. Uh, and we continue to recommend uh, the choices that we made. Um, the peer reviewers also supported the biological reference points that we selected. Um, and just a final note, the FMSY development for the New Jersey, New York, and the Delmarva regions, um, if that were a choice that we want to make in the future, that will require additional spawner recruit data. We'll have to accumulate this with uh, sufficient contrast and stock size. Not that we're suggesting uh, the Delmarva region should 
fish their stock down to low numbers so that we get good contrast for the, the model, but um, hopefully you, you get you understand the, the gist of what we're trying to say there. Uh, the F-based reference point values by region are not exactly comparable, so we wanted to make sure that uh, the board was aware of this. Um, there are differences in age-specific selectivity due to different regulations in place in the southern extent of the stock and the northern extent of the stock. Tatog are fully recruited to the fishery at older ages in the New England area because we have a, a larger minimum size. Um, therefore, more younger fish can contribute to the spawning population before being harvested. And what this does, it, it gives you a, a higher F reference point um, for that area. So um, it was just an important <coughs> note we wanted, we wanted to make uh, to the board. So for the southern New England and the Massachusetts and Rhode Island regions, whichever uh, version of the three region breakdown you prefer, where a longer time series of, to of stock recruit data is available. The MSY-based target reference points were closer to F 50% of SPR than the F40 target proposed for the other regions. So we bring this up um, just as a, a point of interest or for information for the board. So to look at them in the context of each of the three regions, um, it's difficult to make that, that direct comparison. So when you look at it by the numbers, the MSY-based reference points, they're closer to different selections for the SPR uh, information for the Delmarva and the New York, New Jersey regions. So if the stock recruit relationships in New York, New Jersey and Delmarva are similar to the parameters estimated for southern New England, the F30% and F40% um, targets that we selected may exceed the FMSY for those areas. But again, we, we don't know if that's the case. We just wanted to kind of make that point. Okay, final slide. Um, these are the biological reference points, and I'll just I'll leave this table up uh, for your reference if it's even um, readable. But Mike, if you kind of click once, this is the original recommendation for the regional breakout. So Southern New England, uh, in this case, contains Connecticut. And Mike, if you click one more time, this is the alternate recommendation. So again, Delmarva doesn't change. That stays the same. But then uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, that will be your northernmost region. And then the middle region will be Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. And so that is all I have, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jason. We'll turn to the board for questions. Pat Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellent report, Jason. Uh, haven't heard anything that thorough in a long, long time. Uh, question, uh, back to the Long Island Sound eventually being considered as a group or area by itself. Um, you talked about the word harvest. Um, is it that we have a lack of harvest information, such as illegal harvest, uh, that would prevent um, the technical committee from going further with that? Uh, you said it would be worth looking at later. Um, we are concerned with the illegal harvest of, of uh, Tatog, and if that's an issue, then I would like to put that on the table for consideration later, Mr. Chairman. So could you help me with that, Jason? Jason? So. <clears throat> Illegal harvest for Tatog has been a, a pretty hot topic of conversation in the past. I will note that we did not talk about that much at all during the benchmark process. Um, I, I guess what I would offer you is the difficulty with the harvest in Long Island Sound that we were referring to had to do with being able to dif differentiate New York's harvest into Long Island Sound harvest or ocean harvest, not, not that we didn't know what harvest was, but that it was hard for us to determine with, with a high level of resolution where exactly each of these harvest elements uh, is coming from. So that's what we were getting at. We weren't referring to illegal harvest um, in our deliberations at all. 
just to follow on, Mr. Chairman. So, um, have you any idea, or the technical committee have any idea, how they could they could actually um, get more accurate information? Will it take will it take an effort on the part of uh, our DEC to put together some kind of a, a record keeping? Do you have any sense for what might have to be done on New York's part and or well New York's part in particular uh, in order to give you better data? Otherwise, we'll go out of here and tell our constituents that, yeah, gee, it'd be great if we did that. However, we don't know uh, what mechanism the Technical Committee might recommend that we use to improve uh, that data collection so you can make that determination. you have a response, Jason? Yep. <clears throat> so I think the uh, exercise that was undertaken after um, your board meeting by the um, staff members from Connecticut do a good job of parsing out the recreational harvest as best as we can. And you have to make some assumptions, for instance, that um, in particular, like around Montauk, when they're talking about open water, you know, they're not talking about over towards Block Island, that they're, you know, there, there's some assumptions that you have to make, but it's, it's probably a decent way to kind of differentiate harvest for New York on the recreational side. I think the bigger issue is with the commercial data. Um, if your commercial fishermen aren't federally permitted and, and aren't filling out VTR reports, um, it's very difficult to figure out where that harvest came from. So that's the challenge. Um, and there are probably different um, things you could do to collect that information, some sort of logbook requirement for even a state waters fisherman or, or something like that. I, I won't, um, you know, say that's the only option, but there there are probably things that we can do. Um, but it still doesn't solve the issue going backwards in time. So again, assumptions would need to be made that whatever proportions you can glean from any future action you take with your fishery that it applies backwards in time um, that sort of thing so that, that's kind of the challenge so let me just offer i did see a couple more hands up that there are a number of issues this board has discussed in the past the unreported illegal harvest i think it's quite clear that the tc recognizes long island sound and efforts that need to be made there uh, and we could probably talk about those items ad nauseum today uh, i don't think either of those are going to materialistically impact where we are today um, we can have those discussions after we get through the management actions we need to take here today um, but let's keep the questions focused on what the information we have moving forward uh, Steve did you have your hand up it was just uh, to that uh, last conversation I just wanted to mention that we do have state reporting in New York for our state only fishermen so I think it may be a matter of uh, incomplete you know, fishermen not filling out their, their BTRs completely, so. Uh, next I had Tom Fody, then Mark Gibson, then Dave Simpson, and John Clark. I want to make sure I understand, but when you were looking at the data, you were mostly using the party and charter boat fleet, not the private boat fleet in, say, the New York, New Jersey area? Um, <clears throat> yeah, as the, the group of recreational fishermen that fill out VTRs, that was the data set that we analyzed. Yeah, I mean, that does kind of create a problem since a lot of the party and charter boats that are still left in the state that haven't gone out of business are basically lay, lay, lay up in the northern area. But if you look at the private boats that fish for Tatog, they fish from, you know, Matasquan South, a lot of them fish the local the local wrecks or the spots offshore that are not really in the New York, New Jersey waters. And if, you know, I just look, was looking at the new state record we have in New Jersey, and that was 25 pounds, five ounces, caught on April 17th, and that was in uh, Cape May. And they replaced the record that was caught in Ocean City uh, in 1998. So that was also in southern Jersey. A lot of the, a lot of the party boats go up north from, say, Matasquan and, and Shark River, because that is rock ground. 
and you can basically fish a lot of different areas where the, the private boats all fish the artificial reefs or all small rigs or just small pieces of, pro of, of rabble that are out there. So it's really, a, a, when you look at just the party and charter boat, you don't get a real picture of how that's being fished. You, you know, you're talking about 20 miles of a 120 mile coastline. And that's where you're big, you know, you're weighting it much heavier. And if you look at the statistics, I think the recreational boats make up a large part of the, rec the catch, much more than the party and charter boats like we do with, figure out with Summer Flounder, where they only make up 15% of the catch. So your figures might be a little off by just doing it from the party and charter boats uh, logs. And that's my concern here. Can you answer that question? Uh, so the question we heard was, was the information gleaned primarily from the party charter? And the answer to that was yes, yeah. correct? And what was your follow-up question to that? Well, isn't it possible that this is causing a bias because of all the private boats that fish differently than the party and charter boats for blacks uh, for, to talk? And they're really, f a lot of them are further south. When you look at the boats that come out of Barnegat and you look at the boats that come out of Matasquan, they're all are private boats, and also Little Lake Harbor and Ocean City and Atlantic City, they fish in different areas. And there's a lot more private boats in that area than there is up in the northern area. So Jason, can you respond to how looking at the for hire data might have biased this TC review? Yep, uh, so uh, I think the table from the MRIP analysis uh, is up behind us here. <clears throat> and um, so I will say that we certainly acknowledge that it, it was in the presentation as well. We understand that it's a subset of the fishing population is not, uh, it potentially doesn't represent everything. Um, just, I guess, an important consideration though is we didn't use the numbers in any very specific way. Again, it was just uh, an analysis that we did looking at information to see if we could tease out some distinctions that we could make to say, oh yeah, this um, this area goes with this region and, and this area goes with this region. So we didn't use it in a mathematical way, I guess. It was used as descriptive information to help us um, parse this information out. But just the final point of the this MREP analysis, uh, bears out what what you said. Everything you said is accurate. Okay, next we have Mark Gibson. Thank you. Could you go back to the table where we were on the, I think it was the reference point <clears throat> table. <clears throat> yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, a um, couple of things here are confusing me. First, I thought I heard you say that MSY-based reference points were only estimable for the Southern New England region, yet they appear in this table for all the um, permutations. And second, it looks to me as though the first two rows of the bottom table might be transposed because the FMSY is the overfishing limit, but in all cases, that 75% of that is greater, which I'm assuming FMSY is the overfishing limit, 75% of that is proposed as a target, but they're always, they're all greater, the targets are all greater than the threshold right to, to, to clarify the f75 percent FM so this f75 percent MSY is not supposed to be 75 percent of FMSY it's the fishing mortality that will bring your biomass down to 75 percent of your SSB MSY so it it's expected to be at a, a higher okay. F value uh, which is it's I can see how it's confusing, and we should maybe should have clarified that better in the presentation. But yeah, thank you. Credit. And the to your first question about why the the SS the <clears throat> MSY based reference points are we they're estimable in the sense that you can plug the numbers in and come up with a number, but they rely on the stock recruit relationship, and we felt that the stock recruit relationship was more reasonable or reliable in the, n the northern region than it was in the southern two regions. So that while you can put those numbers in and get a number out, we don't feel that those are accurate representations of what SSB MSY or FMSY would be in those two regions. But we presented them because the board wanted to see all possible biological reference points. Thank you. Can I follow up on one other Go point? ahead, Mark. Yeah, the other thing that I remain concerned about is the apparent discrepancy between the percent SPR, the SPR level 
that's associated with FMSY in the northern region, northern New England, I think it said was 50 percent, and yet the proxies for the SPR proxies in the other, other regions are at 30 and 40 percent levels, it implies that the northern stock is much less productive on the terms of recruits per spawner than are the, and I think you mentioned a caveat about what if that wasn't, wasn't true. Um, but I'm just wondering what, what the logic was that if you get a, a reasonable stock recruit curve and that relates to 50 percent SPR at FMSY, the overfishing limit, what was the rationale to go to drop to 30 and 40 percent in the other regions? You know, it was proxies for the FMSY that you didn't think was reliable. Jason? Yeah, <clears throat> this was another um, pretty significant debate that we had at, at the technical committee level. So in, in answer to your question, the, the comparison that we were making was the MSY calculations for southern New England relative to the other regions. And, and again, we didn't necessarily have a good way to say that they are the same. And so when we pick the SPR calculations for the other areas, we fell back to, again, a, a meta-analysis of other similar types of species. And in general, those other species that have similar life histories to Tatog use um, 30 and 40 percent uh, metrics rather than something higher. So that would have been um, to go with something higher was un unprecedented from what we were able to review, and we weren't comfortable that we had the information to justify that. Uh, next up for more questions on the report, we'll go to Dave Simpson. Yeah, I think, um, um, Jay, the report was great. It was, uh, I really appreciate the technical committee taking the extra time between our two meetings to um, bring some clarity to the issue of Long Island Sound and, and uh, <clears throat> the implication, the importance and implications of, of keeping that together or splitting it apart. Um, uh, I did note that in the, um, in the report that we received, unfortunately table five was missing, so the table that represented, so there's a heading there for it, but the table itself that shows the MRIP data broken out by area wasn't available. So I think your figure was the first time uh, that, that folks around the table have seen that. So I think probably in their preparation, they were looking again at VTR data. And, and of course, you, you explained some, and especially in response to questions, some of the concerns. And, and I just wanted to reiterate that, that vessel trip reports are coming from federally permitted party and charter boats and some state waters fishermen. And, uh, you know, if you look at the MRIP data, that only represents about, all party and charter boats represent about 6% of the landings, 94% coming from um, private boats and, and shore anglers. And if you, if you take a rough guess that half of party and charter boats are federally permitted, your sample is 3% of the total, and unfortunately, it's not representative. So I think, because, I think this is important because, as you say, you didn't, the technical committee and SOC assessment didn't quantitatively use this. It created uh, an impression, a, the strong impression of where fish are coming from that I think the MRIP data provides a different perspective on, and you see some flips in proportions for, uh, for New York it's actually a flip that it's not 40% coming from Long Island Sound, it's 60%. And if I could, with the, um, with the board's indulgence, I, I did provide Melissa with a table and a couple of figures that, that help support um, this. Is, is this the figure I gave you, um, Melissa? Well, what's the question you're getting to here, Dave? I mean, um, perhaps this will filter into the discussion on motions for management action. Well, there... I, want to, I want to share with the board to answer some of the questions and concerns that, that were expressed, the basis for the assessment. Uh, you heard that the technical committee, the stock, the peer review actually, was downplaying the importance of the biological distinctions 
in stock areas, the big break being between New York and New Jersey, and, uh, and instead was emphasizing the distribution of, of the, the species and the distribution of harvest and landings. So I think we need a clearer understanding, which MRIP data provides, of, of that sort of thing. Um, and another issue when we choose stock areas is, is this idea that, uh, well, it's the Connecticut survey, so Connecticut goes with southern New England and, and New York and New Jersey can go together. Um, and uh, so we provided this graphic to show that, indeed, the Long Island Sound trawl survey covers both New York and Connecticut waters equally. This is depicting the distribution of Tatog based on our trawl survey over 30-some years so that you can see we sample uh, equally in New York and Connecticut waters, and uh, the distribution of the catch very closely reflects the uh, geology of Long Island Sound, which is to say um, the, the structure being predominantly in Connecticut waters because of the last ice age, that's where the rocks were, were dumped at the end to create the reefs and, and the, uh, the islands. Uh, in comparison to the basically beachfront, the bluffs that you have in the western two-thirds, eastern two-thirds of Long Island, rocks and structure again to the west, uh, which you can see reflected in, in uh, Tatog distribution. So some of our most important sites are in, on Long, are, are in New York waters. All of our biological data reflects that. So I think that's important for people to, uh, to see. And there were two more slides. Well, again, I'm trying to get to the, what the question is at this point. It, it's actually not a question. It's, it's supplementing the information that the board, I think, really needs. Uh, and that is, from an MRIP perspective, um, what the distribution of catch actually looks like. And that's, that's what this shows. So when, and, and Jay actually s slipped, I'll say, when he was describing Rhode Island's catch, saying, based on VTRs, the catch comes mostly from Rhode Island Sound and Block Island Sound. And then later, he refined his comment to say, well, mostly it comes from Narragansett Bay. And that's what MRIP reveals that the VTRs mislead people to believe. Because when you hear Area 612, for example, off of New York and New Jersey, you think there's a common fishery going on between New York and New Jersey out in ocean waters. And the fact is, there's not. not that's not where the predominant fishery I'm is. I'm going to ask that you hold the comments at this I, point and let's stick to questions about the report because I think that statement that was just made is, is not one that is strongly backed up by information we have at this point and I certainly want to give you the latitude to offer your comments. If you have a question on the report, please ask the question at this time. Yeah, we, we do need to cover this. And it's not a question, but this is the fundamental problem I have, and this is why we're talking about this in May and we couldn't settle it in February. So this information does need to be shared with the board so that we can make the right decision today. Great, and I will certainly give you the latitude to continue with that discussion. But let's finish with questions on the TC report. I had John Clark's hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the very informative report, Jason. I just was a little confused. You said at one point that the Peer review thought that some of the regional district differences may be due to uh, almost like a data artifact, like there was more data from some area, yet they strongly recommended going with the regional approach. And I believe just now when you're talking about this, again, I may be misunderstanding. I thought you made it sound like as more data became available, maybe the, uh, the FMSYs would be similar for the different region. Will more data, you think, bring a stronger argument for the regional management approach, or will the biological characteristics start to look more similar? Jason? Yep. Um, so <clears throat> just to clarify, um, as we looked at the information, so I think it's important to, to remember the sequence here. So. You know, we had our benchmark process, lots of meetings, uh, lots of math going on, all this sort of thing. Uh, and then the peer review happened, and then all the things after the peer review happened. So at the time, we were looking at that information 
the biological information and using it to kind of split our regions apart. So that was before the peer review. During the peer review, the reviewers said, well, we appreciate the work that you did. However, we believe the information you're looking at is confounded due to differences in the amount of data for each of the regions that you're looking at. Therefore, you can't statistically say that they are, in fact, different from each other. So what, what we were using, what we used to kind of begin to tease apart this information, the peer review did not weight that very highly. So hopefully that clarifies the, the first part of your, your question. Um, it, it was just a matter of sequence. So they more or less dismissed or, or downweighted the biological information with the exception of the, the migratory information. So in that case, I think what they, they looked at the information that we had provided, that we had looked at, and they said, even though you can't necessarily find a smoking gun to say this region should be together and this region should be together, what you're doing is the right approach. Go as small as you can that the data will allow you to, to um, entertain, and that is the approach. So they supported finer scale assessment and management. However, they did not say region breakout A is better than region breakout B. Yeah, go ahead, follow up. So just to in conclusion then, as more data becomes available, it might be possible to make even finer regions like you were saying about a Long Island Sound region and so forth. Yeah, sorry. Um, so yes, uh, I think uh, in particular different kinds of information might be very valuable, things like genetic analyses. Uh, there have been some studies, um, but I think the one that's going on at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science is pretty comprehensive. And so now you can start to quantitatively and, and not in, you know, what we did was look at all of the information we had available and, and we tried to build a case. It's always preferable if you can do something that can quantify more specifically, these fish go together in this area, these fish go together. It may in fact be that the resolution that a genetic analysis comes up with is too fine for us to be able to to analyze, but it's still good information. And and so yes, I think as we uh, progress through time, we're we're doing a better job of sampling this fishery and and things like that all throughout the range. Um, I think uh, the information will improve, and so will our ability to differentiate regions uh, from each other. Dr. Pierce, another question. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Uh, again, a great report. I've had a question about Table 6B on page 8 of the report, and this is with regard to the three-year average of fishing mortality rate in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, the number that's provided is 0 0.38. Now, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, for a number of years, Collectively, we have established quotas for the tautog fishery, the commercial fishery in our waters. And I know that the recreational fishery takes most of the fish, but, but nevertheless, uh, did you and the technical committee have an opportunity to f evaluate, look at whether the quotas, the, the hard quotas we put in place were effective in constraining the fishing mortality rate to the, and also our recreational fishing measures for that matter. Were they effective in constraining the, uh, the fishery, fishing mortality rate to the, uh, the targets we've been working with for so many years? In other words, we haven't been working with 0 .3, 0 0.38 as a target or 0 0.16. There's been another number, and I can't recall exactly what it was, but to what extent were the restrictions in our two states effective in keeping us to the mortality rate target that we've been living with as a region? Because you've got point, point 0.38 here, so I'm just wondering, why is it so high? Jason? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thank you. Um, so it's a good question, and, and I think the first most important thing to remember is when we were doing the Rhode Island, Massachusetts 
assessment using uh, VPA uh, to perform that, it's a completely different technique and it's much more deterministic with how it treats harvest information. So um, there's two things that kind of play into this and that is the, the commercial quotas because of the magnitude of the recreational fishery are not going to have a strong influence. The commercial quotas kept the harvest of the commercial sector within that kind of 10% realm that it had historically been in. I think Massachusetts is a bit higher, but in, in uh, Rhode Island it is about 10%. Um, and so it is effective in keeping it within its sort of historical proportions. Um, overall, for the harvest, though, the recreational sector overwhelms it. And so with regard to the recreational side, we have put in a lot of different procedures over the years. We had been pretty proactive, uh, increasing the minimum size, putting in spawn enclosures in Rhode Island, uh, very low bag limit in Massachusetts. However, it's just an artifact of the sampling of this fishery by MRIP, um, as well as you know the magnitude, again, of the recreational side, that the harvest it would be low for a year or two, then it would jump up dramatically over 100% in one year. Um, and again, I think it's more an artifact of the MRIP sampling than of what actually happened. But to loop back around to your question, according to the VPA that we were managing with, we were uh, doing a decent job of staying within the bounds of what we thought fishing mortality was. However, with this new analysis using the statistical model, the information changed and, and so we've not been doing a very good job of constraining um, our fishery when using the statistical framework. If I may, Mr. Chairman, one follow-up question. Uh, Please do. Is it also possible that the reason why the mortality rate uh, is higher than where we thought it would be is just illegal harvest? And we have many examples of, in Massachusetts certainly, illegal harvest, uh, closed seasons not being adhered to, um, fishermen um, not reporting properly. We have enforcement actions that have been revealing this problem. So could that be one reason? Massachusetts has that problem. Rhode Island might have that problem too. So is that possibly one reason why the mortality rate is higher than expected? Jason? Um, <clears throat> so. I will answer in two ways. Um, it was a number of years ago that we actually looked at. We were seeing that we appeared to be meeting our fishing mortality targets, and we were not getting a response in biomass. So we weren't getting this increase in biomass. So in exercise, it was uh, Jenny Nestlage who um, did the exercise, but she tried to determine what the difference would be between where we think F is and why we're not getting the response that we expect. And it, uh, she turned that into, you know, a fishing mortality or a mortality gap and then applied that up to the population to see how many fish that would actually equate to. And it was a huge amount of fish. Maybe that's uh, realistic, maybe it's not. Um, it seems at the time that it would, it would need a, a large infrastructure to be able to secretly move these fish around. Maybe that exists, I, I don't know. On the other, um, the second part of what I will say is that really doesn't play into the fishing mortality estimate because we don't know what that harvest is. It doesn't play into our calculation. So could it be the reason why we're not seeing a, a rebound in, uh, or any <coughs> biomass we're building? Yes. Does it impact the calculation of these um, these terminal year estimates, um, no, because we don't know what that, uh, what that harvest is. Okay. Uh, I had not seen any other hands, so do we have any other questions? One more from Pat Augustine. Question on the technical committee report. A question on their request, Mr. Chairman. Do we need to make an, uh, a motion to adopt their the biological reference points, or we, have we already done that, or did we do that in our previous meeting? I don't believe we did. 
The next order of business will be considering an initiation of an amendment to address stock units and the reference points contained therein, or a rebuilding program, so we don't need a motion with regards to accepting the technical committee report or anything at this time. Follow on, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion on the table that was, uh, uh, it was tabled at our last meeting, um, item number five under index of motions. It was moved to uh, substitute or develop an amendment three regions, uh, northern, southern, and Delmarva. Were you going to take that or could we take that from the table, please? Well, hang on. Let me check with staff on that. My initial consultation with them this morning indicated that the table was clear, but let me double check on that. Okay, so I'm getting the word from staff that the slate is clean, that we do not need to bring a motion Point of back correction, to the correction, table. Mr. Chairman? Let me yep. turn to Tony for clarification we'll move again, to table. because Montgomery this is something meeting. I'm getting from staff, so let me give them a moment. Thank you. So here's what the issue is. That motion that you're contemplating contemplates initiating an addendum. Staff is indicated as per the agenda that in order to accomplish what is required at this point for a rebuilding program that it would require an amendment. So we're working to figure out the right way through that. So let me, are there any other questions on the technical committee report at this point. All right, seeing none, I think that moves us on to agenda item number five with the potential board action for board action to consider initiation of an amendment to propose the two stock unit definitions in a rebuilding program. Before we get to that point, let me turn the floor back over to Mr. Simpson, who can conclude his presentation and the information he wanted to present to the board to feed into that discussion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Melissa, Melissa could you put up that last slide that we had, or Mike? Um, so it's the um, slide of the MRIP data. We covered the trawl survey. Long Island Sound Trawl Survey. Um, so uh, that's it. Yeah, thank you. So, so this is the Marine Recreational Information Program data, a bubble plot of of the uh, expanded harvest. Um, so the the center of each of those bubbles is the sample site, the interview site, the intercept site, and uh, it. it shows a lot of detail that you don't get in a table, and that's why I thought it was a great supplement. And as I started to say, you can see how Rhode Island's harvest is really concentrated up in Narragansett Bay. Um, and the, the color coding, to be clear, um, green indicates that the, the fishermen that was interviewed indicated they were fishing in inland waters of one type or another. Um, so, uh, and yellow indicates that they were, shows that they, they indicated they were fishing in ocean waters less than three miles from shore. So generally speaking, they were fishing in state waters, that red line. Uh, they're fishing less than three miles from shore. Red indicates that they were fishing greater than three miles from shore. So you can see there's an overwhelming tendency for to tog fishing, not surprisingly, to occur in near shore waters. So it helps you to be uh, it helps to begin to understand the, the degree of overlap in New York between 
the neighbor to the north, Connecticut, and their neighbor to the south, uh, New Jersey, um, that there really is a, a fair amount of separation. There's clearly overlap in the New York Bite area, New York Harbor. They're probably going back and forth. I'm, I'm sure they are, but uh, I think this helps a lot in understanding where the where the fishery is occurring. And and uh, so I thought it would be really important for the board to see to kind of bring life to the the table that the uh, technical committee put together. Uh, so I appreciate the the moment on that. If people have questions or um, um, if you don't mind. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Mr. Clark. Yeah, thanks. Dave, does this is suggesting that pretty much all your Tautog landings are coming from the eastern half of Connecticut? Um, I couldn't hear you, John. John, pull the mic. Sorry about that. I was just asking whether that indicates that your Tautog landings in Connecticut are overwhelmingly coming from the eastern half or third of the state there? Yeah, that was an, a really interesting thing in, in doing this graphically. You know, you can look at tables all day long and look at summaries, but when we put it on a map, uh, it did open our eyes. We do know that there's a very substantial fishery to the east, uh, but based on the, the information they give us, fishing in inland waters, we can see there's very little overlap. There's some, but there's very little overlap with Rhode Island. Um, and, and it has to do with, uh, I was talking with uh, Dr. Van Voorhees last night about this a little bit, weighting of sites and, and so forth. And as we, um, as we look ahead to doing the MRIP survey, we're certainly going to take another look. We've already had clues of this, but take another look at the weighting of our sites uh, to the central and west, because there are certainly important fisheries uh, where it starts to get bare is New Haven. New Haven and west, there's a lot of great to talk fishing. If you remember from our trawl survey index, there was a lot of catch down that way. And um, so those, those things complement, but don't map one to one because our trawl survey is picking the fish up in, during the spawning season when they're out on open bottom where they're available to the trawl. So, you know, we'll catch, we'll catch uh, 500 pounds of tautog and a tow in Connecticut, or we used to when the stock was bigger. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's some, it's great insight as all the states, frankly, think about their MRIP surveys, look at these things graphically, I think is really insightful. Uh, Jason, you did not want to make a comment on that. Uh, we'll take a couple of comments or questions on this information. I saw Tom Fody's hand, then Emerson Hasbrook. I, I'm having real difficulty with this t table that uh, Dave just put up there. If I'm looking at this right, it says most of our, our landings in New Jersey come from within state waters. And truthfully, just the opposite is true. I mean, if you think about it, we fish a lot of on artificial reefs and for wrecks off there. And so they're all outside of three miles. We only have two reefs inside of state waters. The rest of the 13 and a half, actually 13 and a half, are all in federal waters. And that's where a lot of that, plus a lot of the wrecks are all further off than that. So this thing doesn't show me really anything. I, what it shows me is that we have poor data <laughs> that's going into this because we're not fishing in shore, except for a few areas like Point Pleasant Canal, which most of those fish are illegal. So <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this table works. Yeah, I think that's a fair question, Tom. I mean, just on a personal note, I can let you know that where most of my fishing occurs out of Atlantic City, and I know I'm one of the few people submitting VTRs from there, this reflects no fishing activity for Tautog beyond three miles, and that's about all that there is for boat fishermen there outside of the shore-based fishermen. Uh, Emerson, did you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and it relates to the issue that, that Tom just raised. So, Dave, when you studied your presentation, um, I think what you said, and, and, and please clarify for me, was that these circles initiate these the circles are relative to intercept sites. Is that correct? So yes. Okay. So where the where the base of the circle is is the intercept site, and then the diameter of the circle is based on. Did you say the the number of people that they spoke to, or or the amount of catch, or both? It's the magnitude. Okay. It's the expanded harvest estimate. Okay, but that doesn't mean that that's where the harvest took place. 
it's, it's where the fish were brought ashore. It was, it's the intercept point. It's where the fish were brought ashore. It's not where they were harvested. So the harvest area, for instance, may reflect more your trawl survey data. So, so this, again, doesn't really show where the harvest took place, just where they were landed and the amount of fish that was landed at that intercept site. Exactly, and then you draw an inference of what water body they may have been fishing in, but it doesn't mean they were fishing, you know, it's a boat, so they, they may have gone and very likely, very commonly do go across the sound to fish, but then they returned home, and there's, the whole point is we do that a lot, especially with Tatal. Connecticut goes to Rhode Island, uh, New York, New York goes to Connecticut, so you're, you're exactly right, but it's brought ashore at, at the indicated point. Thank you. Okay, so where we are is we've got two items of business that we need to address before we move into further discussion about potential management response. One, we have the question of tabled motions that we need to address. Uh, the second item that I'm also going to turn to Tony for uh, is to address what we specifically need to do through amendment or addendum so that we're clear on what our actions here today would need to be. So let me first turn to Tony for that and then Mike is going to bring up the index of motions from the last meeting and we can figure out what we need to clear from there, how we can address that and move forward today. Thank you, Adam. So the board was considering um, changes to the stock unit definitions and changes to the stock unit definitions um, through the paint through the plan need to be changed via amendment. TATOG is one of the first um, management documents that were, was completed by the commission and it has a very limited adaptive management section. There are very few things that you can do through adaptive management in TATOG. So um, this is one of those things that we need to do through an amendment. If the board wants to take out more than one set of stock units, to public comment, you, we can do that. The um, amendment would need to, it, at minimum, contain a rebuilding schedule for those um, units that are overfished and overfishing is um, occurring. So if we take out more than one, we'd have a couple of different rebuilding time, time frames or rebuilding schedules for um, each of the units, um, compartments. Uh, that we took out for comment. Um, in terms of the motions that are on the table, if the board um, has no objection, you don't have to take those motions. You can decide not to take them off the table. You could do it, deal with it that way, Adam, in, this, in its simplest form. Otherwise, if there is an objection, then we would um, need to vote them up or down. Okay, so if I'm understanding clearly, we could take multiple stock unit options out for public comment, or we could include one option, but either way they have to go through the amendment process and we just need to decide today whether we're going to take one or multiple out for public comment. Correct. And the, the board would also need to give staff direction if you want them to uh, also address rebuilding in in those uh, in that amendment so do we want to also consider um, management controls to address those areas that are overfished and overfishing is occurring okay uh, let me turn to the board for questions or clarifications on that matter and uh, while we're doing that Mike if you could bring up those past motions and then we can decide how to address those or dispense with them. Uh, for hands, I had Dave Pierce, Dave Simpson, I'll go right down the table, Pat Augustine, and Russ Allen. All right, so we'll start with Dave Pierce. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I suggest, yeah, I suggest in the interest of uh, simplicity and keeping us uh, focused that in response to the presentation that was just given to us by the technical committee, uh, by Jason, as to the options that for stock definition, 
as to the options they feel make the most sense, uh, we can agree, the board can agree to not consider the motion that was uh, tabled or postponed until today because that motion, first of all, references an addendum, and you've already addressed the issue, it should be an amendment, and it also states that we should consider a northern and region breakdown. Uh, the northern and region breakdown is irrelevant now because of um, that particular breakdown being shown in Table 6C, and that's not anything that the technical committee said we should be considering. So I think we can start fresh and not get uh, bogged down by that motion that uh, I had made at the last meeting that was uh, tabled until today. All right, let me finish with the rest of the comments. I'm somewhat hopeful that's the direction the board will head. Dave Simpson. Yeah, at this point I had a motion if that's uh, appropriate. Let me finish with dispensing these first. Pat Augustine. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I can assume according to Robert's rules of order, if we just don't touch it, it goes away automatically at the end of the meeting and we don't have to do anything more. Russ Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, ju I just want a little bit more clarification on the addendum amendment process. I thought I heard Tony say that in order to change reference points, you had to go through the amendment process. But we did not do that for striped bass the last time we did addendum four. So I'm, I'm kind of, I was kind of confused on that because I've seen the precedent already set. So I just wanted to make sure. Tony, can you clarify for Russ, please? It's the stock unit boundaries. I don't know if that helps you, Russ. Yes, thanks, Tony. I mean, that's what I thought, but when I heard the, you say reference points, not stock unit boundaries, I think he said them both, but I just wanted to make sure that was clarified. Okay, last comment, Emerson. Yeah, to follow up on uh, what Russ said, um, and not to pick on you, Tony, but I, I thought you said that we need to decide what stock definition we want to include in the amendment, and do we want to include a rebuilding strategy? Yeah. So that rebuilding strategy is going to be based on the new reference points, isn't it? Tony? Well, when you have a, a stock unit boundary, then you would have reference points that go along with that stock unit boundary, and then those reference points would then lead to a rebuilding plan, and then the rebuilding plan would potentially lead to management measures, depending on how you are performing up against your reference points. And we... And logically, since you can't change the stock unit boundaries without an amendment, we would incorporate all of these parts into the same amendment at the desires of the board. Okay, so that brings us back to these motions that are here. I sounds like we have two possible courses of action. One course of action is to simply not address these at all and they will simply disappear at the end of this meeting unless the board would like to formally withdraw them. Um, let, me, let me just simply ask, is there any objection at this point to withdrawing and not moving forward with these motions today. Okay, seeing none from the board, I will then turn to Dave Simpson who indicated he had a motion to address the stock unit and rebuilding program amendment. And we'll start fresh from there. So we can start with a clean screen, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I provided a motion to Mike uh, and with a little help from them getting clear that we do in fact need an amendment. I uh, move to initiate an amendment to respond to the 2015 benchmark, benchmark stock assessment for three stock areas, Master Rhode Island, comma, Connecticut to New Jersey, comma, and Delaware to North Carolina. I'll just first ask staff, does this address the concerns about the need for defining stock units in the FMP? Yes. Okay, so that would be a valid motion. I will look for a second to that motion, and I see one from Mr. Augustine at this time. Discussion on the motion. 
Tom Fody and Mark Gibson. Be because of, of the problem putting New Jersey up with Connecticut have two entirely different fisheries. I mean, this, this uh, we, we got moved to the summer flounder and put a regionalization, and at least we knew the fish migrated between Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. This fishery is not a region. This fishery basically persecutes the, uh, prosecutes the fishery in a different pattern. I mean, we don't have the st same structure that Long Island Sound does. It has nothing to do with it. The fish do not migrate from Long Island Sound to New Jersey. And I can't see any valid reason for putting New Jersey in with Connecticut in this. So I would like to include the other option in this so, out for public hearings that would basically include the option of uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, and Connecticut, and New Jersey and was it New Jersey and um, New York, and Delaware to North Carolina, because we're going to public hearings, and I need something to take out to public hearings that at least makes sense. This does not make sense for New Jersey. So I'm, wishing, I'm looking to amend the motion at least to consider that when we go out to public hearings. I mean, truthfully, if you look at our fishery and the 100 miles of it, we belong in the southern region, not in, in the northern region at all. So we should really be in the Del Marva if you look at where we catch our big fish and where our private boats actually operate at. So, you know, that's what I'm looking at right now. I'd like to take it a second for that. So is that a motion, or are you looking for someone else to make the motion? No, no I'm looking to make the motion. Okay, and your motion is? That basically include the other options that were in the, in the technical committee report as valid. And that would be the one other option of mass through Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, North Carolina, but not include the two regions nor the one coastwide. Would that be correct? That'd be correct. All right, so let's give staff a moment to get that up. Do I have a second for that? John Clark? Okay, so we now have another motion before us. We can go ahead and continue the debate on these. Mr. Simpson. Uh, is it my turn or was somebody else ahead of me? I, um, if, if it's my turn, that, then... Uh, um, but. Okay, I got Mark Gibson down on my list, so let me turn to him and then I'll come back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, on the motion, I was prepared to support the, um, you know, the initial motion. Um, on the amendment, I guess I'm probably not in support of that at this time. I think the, the stock area's definitions are a decision for the board as to what, what to go out with. Uh, not so much for public input. They're simply going to cherry pick where Connecticut should go, go based on the amount of reduction they need to take uh, in the regions that doesn't receive Connecticut. Um, so I don't think you're going to get objective public input on that matter. And I think we're better suited to make that decision here and narrow the scope of the um, of the action. So I guess I don't support the amendment. <clears throat> Dave Simpson. Yeah, thanks. And uh, uh, similarly, I, I think the the original motion is is stronger. And and to Tom's concern, I you know I, I do share that concern. It's always difficult to figure out where to draw a line. And you know, um, unfortunately, we we have only the options that were evaluated at this point. And there's been a lot of discussion, and in, in, including in Jay's presentation. Um, the discussion that down the line uh, a Long Island Sound assessment would would be the preferable way to go. So that that would be my intention moving forward. As I mentioned yesterday at the policy board meeting, uh, the University of Connecticut um, and and the commission is well aware of this is is already uh, beginning work on a Long Island Sound stock assessment. So I would hope my, I would envision that if we pass the original motion that we would we would begin to work almost immediately to recognize the difference between the South Shore, Long Island, uh, and New Jersey area versus Long Island Sound. Um, but the, the, the essential thing in my mind is that 
splitting Long Island Sound is, is, a, is a fatally flawed decision or pathway to go down because uh, as the assessments were done, um, it, it, it missed the realization that the Long Island Sound Trawl Survey is sampling both New York and Connecticut and the Long Island Sound Trawl Survey is used as an index for you know, uh, a mass to Connecticut assessment but wouldn't be used in a New York to Jer New Jersey assessment. And I use the analogy of trying to, trying to fill a, a, a bucket full of holes. We're going to keep losing fish to a southern region that won't be reflected in their stock assessment and, and we'll be perpetually cutting our catch to no avail. So it's, it's fatally flawed to, to break Long Island Sound in half. And it's not just an issue for Connecticut and New York, for the, for the board that's considering this stock, it's 30% of the total harvest, so it's not a trivial area. So I, I, um, I don't support the amendment, I support the initial motion. Okay, I've got Dave Pierce, then Tom Fody, then John Clark. Yeah, we have a, a very good report from the technical committee, and we have uh, advice that is not going to change, so I'm going to go with that advice, recognizing that there is um, some uncertainty with regard to what's preferred from the technical committee. However, after listening to all of the discussion and the answers to the questions that were posed to Jason, um, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to go with the original motion and not to go with the motion to amend, that is to include that additional stock area. And the, the reasons to me are quite clear, and David Simpson has already touched on two of them. Uh, number one, we really do need a Long Island Sound stock unit, but we're not going to get there, not yet. So we have to start off with a stock unit that makes the most sense. And the one that makes the most sense is the one that does not split Long Island Sound. We've heard this uh, argument about the sound and not splitting the sound at our last meeting and now here as well. So um, we really should not be splitting the sound. Um, the, the other reason why I strongly prefer the original motion is one comment that was made by, by Jason in his presentation, and that is that the technical committee strongly endorsed the uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region uh, with caveats, but nevertheless strongly endorsed it. We have to take action on this. Uh, I don't want to prolong for the debate uh, after public hearing on basically what the technical committee has provided. So I'm ready to go with that particular recommendation, advice from them. So the motion is, the original motion is the one that uh, I would be supporting. Tom Fody. Yeah, I can understand why Massachusetts and Rhode Island about, want to go with the original motion because they managed to push Connecticut down on, on us. And in New Jersey, which has no fishery that, is, that compared, I mean, truthfully, we fish as was put out in the document in the report, we get larger fish in New Jersey than you do in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. They are more similar on the growth patterns of those fish and the aging patterns of those fish. Uh, you know, also, it's, it's, if I come out with just this proposal, you're going to get the same, what happened in the last regionalization, you're going to get no support whatsoever from New Jersey from any of the public hearings that happen in there, and so we just get another plan jammed down New Jersey's throats. I mean, this is supposed to be done in a, in a fair, fair manner, and sometimes it just looks like we're, because we're stuck in the middle, we get caught in the middle of this. We really belong in the southern region, just because when you did the stock assessment, you didn't put forward that we should be down in the Del Marva and pace where we started out from, and all of a sudden got basically moved up north now. Uh, I have real problems with the process that we go through that basically kind of gives us a short end of the stick just because we're in the middle. Next, I have John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, as the seconder of the amended motion, I'm very much in favor of taking it out to the public with both options. The technical committee endorsed both options. I understand the arguments on both sides. Um, being from a state that has a shared body of water, we have many regulations that differ between Delaware and New Jersey. and. We handle that. It's not that big a deal. I think the public should have the opportunity to comment on both of these because they were both uh, strongly endorsed by the technical committee. Thank you. Russ Allen. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John hit on many of the points I was going to talk about. I, you know, in listening to Jason talk and, and going through the technical committee report, there was a few things that stood out to me, and that was the biological ev evidence from New Jersey is different than Long Island Sound. So when I hear people use that double standard as this is the best way things should be, I'm not so sure about that when, when, when you get that kind of information. Um, the growth constants are not consistent between New Jersey and Connecticut, another thing that came out of the technical committee report. And the key thing was the technical committee and the peer review agreed that either three region option was okay to move forward with, not one or the other looks better. Um, they supported both of those options. And I think we'd be doing a disservice to the public not to have those two options out there. I, I don't really understand why we would want to go with one option. I can agree with Mark if we want to have the conversation now and decide, okay, this is what we're doing in the future, then there's no need for public comment. So um, I'm comfortable with the amended motion and I'm not comfortable with the, the initial one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So let me apologize for not following an order of taking comments in opposition and in favor of an alternating order. I let it go in for and against in groups there. So let me try to get back to the idea of for and against. So we just heard a comment that I believed was in favor of the amendment. The next speaker I had on the list was Emerson. Are you for or against the amendment? In favor of the amendment? In okay. favor? All right, let me go to Pat Augustine. Are you for or against the amendment? Uh, All right, go ahead. You have the floor, Mr. Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two of the previous speakers hit it right on the head. Uh, Jason's presentation said they could go with either one. Um, option one would have certain advantage. Option two would have other advantage. And uh, to deprive the public, I, I supported the first one because I wanted to see us focus on what we were trying to accomplish here. But I think we're, we're uh, denying the public an opportunity to see it. We're kicking the can down the road. Doesn't I'm matter. Sure I'm speaking in opposition. I'm speaking in opposition of option, Amendment 2. I would, I would actually move to table both of them and create one more motion that encompasses both the alternatives. So I'm opposed to the amendment. Well, if you're making that motion, I am going to rule that out of order. It's my belief that that is exactly what the amendment does, is that it creates the two options to go out to public comment. The amendment, as it's posted, does not only take that one option out for public comment. It would create a main <coughs> motion that takes two options out for public comment. I stand corrected. Okay, I will next turn to Emerson, who was in favor. I know Mr. Augustine said he was opposed, but I think after that clarification, he may have actually been in favor. Uh, let, let me go up. Mr. O'Reilly, were you in favor or against the amendment? Okay, so I've got... So I've got two speakers that are in favor of the motion to amend. Do I have anyone who hasn't yet spoken who is opposed to the motion to amend? Yeah. Okay, seeing none, I'll turn to Emerson and then Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, supporting the amendment doesn't mean that we can't choose in the future to go with um, Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut through New Jersey and then Delaware through North Carolina. Nor does it commit us to um, Massachusetts through Connecticut and, and New York and New Jersey. We still have those options going forward. I would like to hear what fishermen in New York have to say about these two options. I'd like to get their input. I don't, I'm also interested in what fishermen from Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Jersey have to say. So before I make a final decision, I'd, I'd like to get public comment on these two options. Um, and, and particularly since both of these options um, are, well, they're not both preferred, but they're both supported by the technical committee. One was preferred and one was whatever we call it. Um, so that, so uh, since they both have um, 
the support of the technical committee and are supported by the latest stock assessment, my suggestion is let's give ourselves the option to hear what the public has to say before we make a final decision. Mr. O'Reilly? Yeah, I'm falling out in that camp myself. I think that uh, if it were a little more clear cut around the board, it'd be one thing, but it seems that we spent a lot of time um, debating both situations on where Connecticut will end up. Uh, we do have a situation to look forward to, it seems to me, for Long Island Sound. Uh, that's going to take a little time, obviously. I think we still come back. We may have some of the same debates, um, but I also think probably when we start the rebuilding, it's, you know, based on getting all the 2014 data in um, and looking at that, it may be that the rebuilding looks different even than the way it looks now. And so I would suspect that that's going to be the important component here. And, uh, you know, I also wish to see both these options. We've gone back and forth last meeting. Uh, there was a lot of discussion this meeting. There's more discussion. Um, I think that means that we're not quite ready, and I do want to see both go out. Okay. Seeing no further hands on this topic, I will give the board a moment to caucus, and then we will call the question. That is then going to need to be followed by uh, once we dispense with these motions, we will need to address direction to the PDT. So let me clarify what you're caucusing on right now is the motion to amend to include the additional stock area boundaries of Mass and Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and North Carolina. Motion by Mr. Foti, seconded by Mr. Clark. I'll give the board a moment to caucus. Okay, is the board ready for the question? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to amend, please raise your hand. <coughs> I'm sorry, was seven in favor? All those opposed? Three opposed? Null votes, zero. Abstentions, zero. Motion carries, seven to three, zero to zero. The amended motion will now become the main motion. If we could get that cleaned up on the board. Bear with us a moment while we get that amended motion up. We're getting close. You ready for me to try reading that, Mike? Yeah, I guess it is my Okay. So the motion before the board, move to initiate an amendment to respond to the 2015 benchmark stock assessment for both sets of three stock areas, the first being Mass through Rhode Island, Connecticut through New Jersey, and Delaware through North Carolina, the second being Mass through Connecticut, New York and New Jersey, and Delaware through North Carolina. 
Is there a need to further caucus on that motion? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand. I count nine in favor. All those opposed? One opposed, null votes, abstentions. The motion carries by a vote of nine to one to zero to zero. Okay, I've got a couple hands going up. This is relevant to the direction we're going to give the PDT to move forward. Uh, Mr. Simpson, followed by Mr. Pierce. Thanks. Um, so it's always, you know, it's always awkward to um, offer up a, a plate of salad or steak to the public and ask them to choose which they'd like to dine on. So uh, I think it's important that they know the nutritional value. Um, so the important, to be serious, the, the important issue for the public to understand and, and clearly to me for the board to understand deeper, it's not where to put Connecticut. It's where to put the Long Island Sound trawl surveying. That's, that's the heart of this. And what I think we'll need from the PDT is a better understanding of what it will mean for New York and New Jersey to be managed absent the information from the Long Island Sound trawl surveying that is being conducted in an area where more than half of New York's harvest is coming from. And the flip side of that, I think the public will need a better understanding of what it will mean for mass through Connecticut to be managed where the Long Island Sound Troll Survey is included, but New York's harvest and exploitation on that stock is not. I think they're going to need a better, we will all need a better understanding of that so that we can make an objective, intelligent decision at the end of the day on this. So to that point, let me put Tony or Katie on the spot here. Maybe you can just provide some direction to the board on some questions you'd like specifically answered today from the board as we move forward with this draft amendment before it comes back to the board. Well, recall that uh, the first step in an amendment process is a PID. So the PID is going to is typically more general unless the board would like us to be more specific in within the document. Um, so we asked, you know, general questions, and I think you know one of those questions would be: Should the stock, you know, be managed using the first uh, stock area boundary option or the second stock area boundary option? But there wouldn't be specific rebuilding time frames or anything following that. We would ask if a stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring, how much time should we give to rebuild the stock? You know, general questions of that sense. Um, what types of management measures should we consider um, to, to rebuild a stock? Um, in the background section, Dave, I'm hearing from you that you would like some uh, more specifics than maybe we normally would do in a PID document, um, but we can provide that information and we can work with you and maybe Greg um, in order to pull that information together so that it is understandable for the public. I think that's going to be the hardest part is getting simplifying it enough so that folks really can grasp what's going on. And, you know, we can work with Katie in doing that as well, and Jason um, and other folks. If there are other more specific things instead of a more general um, set of questions that we typically do in a PID, it would be great for the board to let us know that today. Okay, so we're taking the comments on what will go into the PID. From a timeline perspective, are we likely to see this in August or not till the annual meeting? Yeah. We'll shoot for August um, for this. Uh, we are going to be looking to do some interviews soon for a new coordinator. The new person that we hire will take this role, take this species on. Um, so there'll be a, a learning curve there. Um, but this is a place where other staff can step in and help some along the way, myself included. Um, but we won't make any not no guarantees for august but that's what we will shoot for the other thing that we will need to get from the board is um, members of the pdt because i don't believe we have done a management document in a while and so that pdt needs to be re um, restaffed 
And is that an additional item you need done here today, or is that something that can be put forth moving forward in the next couple of weeks? We can do that in the next couple of weeks. We don't have to have it today, but just to get it on your minds, thinking about individuals that would be helpful for a PDT. Okay, so next on the list to speak, I had Dr. Pierce and then Dr. Daniel. Okay, I'm glad to hear what uh, Tony had to say regarding the, the next step, PDT, uh, discussions about the rebuilding timeframes and the management measures that would be uh, considered for us to achieve the different uh, targets uh, for each option. Uh, with that said, um, regardless of the outcome, of um, the public hearings and the comment that we get back and regardless of the outcome that will result from this board eventually having to make a decision as to what stock unit to adopt, we have another major issue to address. And I've already alluded to it early on in my comments and that is looking at the first option that's going to be going to public hearing, we're assuming the mortality rate this is Mass, Rhode Island, Connecticut. We're assuming the mortality rate is 0.48. The F target is 0.15. That's a big difference. Long way to go to get to that particular F target. If we go with the, the other option, we'd be at 0.38. Uh, that's the three-year average that we're working with now for sufficient mortality, and we have to get to a target of 0.16. Again, a big difference. So a lot will have, we have to done. The recreational fisheries and the commercial fisheries are going to be subjected to some rather dramatic changes, I suspect, in the management measures that will uh, have to be considered and not adopted by this board. So this is a very big deal. So with that said, I would like to make a motion that relates to a necessary step this board should take in concert with the Law Enforcement Committee. It's a motion that pertains to illegal harvest, to unauthorized harvest that we discussed in the past at previous board meetings and that uh, still, as far as we're concerned in Massachusetts, and I think other states as well, is a burning issue that needs to be addressed. And this is what I would offer then as a motion. Uh, I would move to establish a joint subcommittee of the Tatog Management Board and the Law Enforcement Committee to study problems of unauthorized harvest and sale of Tatog, <coughs> especially the well-publicized live fish market in local and interstate commerce that likely is contributing to current levels of overfishing. The Joint Committee is to, one, determine the feasibility of ASMFC mandating a fish tagging program for each state that would minimize the unlawful commerce of Tatog and provide traceability of all fish and commerce back to the state of origin and harvester and, if feasible, then offer details of such a program to accomplish the two aforementioned objectives. That uh, is, it's work, it's work to be done, but if we don't control the, um, the market, so to speak, in other states, any particular measure taken in the northern region, let's say Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, those measures will be likely undercut, ineffective because of the availability of markets in other states and the untraceability of the fish to those markets. So this is not exactly the same thing as striped bass tagging, but it's similar to it. It's going to involve some work, but necessary work as we prepare for whatever will uh, be in store after we're through with this amendment. So that's, that's my motion, Mr. Chairman. And a tremendous job by Mr. Wayne in reading your mind to have that prepared. <laughs> no, th thank you very much for providing that ahead of time due to its length. Do I have a second for that? Uh, seconded by Mr. Augustine. Uh, let me first turn to Dr. Daniel, who had his hand up before, and then we'll come back for further discussion on this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and I'm in travel mode, and really didn't and didn't know I was on this board, um, and and so I am on this board, and I kind of ask the question, why am I on this board? Um, so I don't have any tall talks. Um, and I'm concerned about, I mean, we see one every now and then. It's a rare event. Um, I can't find any landings of Tautog for us. And so it just dawned on me when I was sitting in the back thinking about Southern Flounder that that my, my North Carolina was listed in the motion as an area for stock assessments and stuff. I don't know what you're going to get from us. Um, and I don't know exactly what is expected of us for Tautog. I really don't think we should be on the board 
I don't know what the process is for that, but um, if somebody can give me some in indication as to what this may mean for North Carolina by being included, I don't, maybe nothing, but I just don't want th there to be some requirements of my state, particularly for a staff person to have to help with this assessment if we don't have any fish. And I will turn to staff to address your concerns. Lewis, um, a, a state can request to be removed from a board. It's just part of the de declaration of interest of whether or not your state wants to be, you know, part of the management, part of the board. But there is a small occurrence of Tatog in down south in North Carolina, so we'd still likely include North Carolina as part of this stock unit boundary. That does not necessarily mean you have to be a part of the management unit, per se, that has specific measures to reduce F, um, but biologically speaking, the Tatog do occur, so therefore we include it as part of the stock unit boundary. Just like we still include you in the stock unit boundary for North Carolina in Lobster, but you're not on the management board. And it, these northern fish have caused me a lot of problems this week, so I just am trying to trying to avoid any additional problems. So the, I, I agree. I, we have seen them in North Carolina. It's just it's just a rare event, and I just want to make sure that we're not getting calls for data on Tautog and mess y'all up in any way. So I appreciate the clarification. Okay, thank you very much. So that brings us back to the motion here before us. Uh, Mr. Augustine, did you want to speak as seconder on the motion? Well, uh, Dr. Pierce did an excellent job of capturing what my concern was um, when we had the ISFMP board yesterday. Uh, it's a little wordy, but it covers everything. The only thing it doesn't have is a, um, a date to report back to us. And if Dr. Pierce wouldn't mind, could we add in there, uh, maybe report back to the board at the annual meeting? Would that give the um, committee time enough to be formed and, and uh, then address the issue? Well, let me again turn to staff for some feedback on their thoughts about what could be accomplished moving forward. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think the question to the board would be, do you expect the results of this or want the results of this to be included in the PID? Um, I think we can we can easily come up with some general discussion points and, and things to, to bring up to the public um, it, for the PID about illegal harvest and other things that they, they feel like they should inform the board of, but, but that won't happen. You know, getting this work done and including it in the PID will not allow the PID to happen at the August meeting. Uh, so it's really up to the board. I, I, I would recommend some general concepts go into the PID so that document can move forward, talking about illegal harvest and, and basically what we do and don't know about that, then have the public comment on that in general during the first round of kind of scoping hearings, PID hearings, and then have this, have this work group or joint subcommittee, I guess we're calling it, um, respond to the board at the annual meeting probably makes the most sense. So there is some, based on the previous actions of this board, we know there's some additional information out there that the law enforcement has provided before, so I think that information could be included. Um, but in order to date stamp this at this time with the expectation it would be included in the PID would likely delay that process. So everybody's comfortable then that we would move forward with this put what information we had available in the PID, but would not be waiting on the PID pending completion of this task. Okay, uh, Mark Gibson, you wanted to address? Yeah, thank you, it's, appreciate Dr. Pierce. It's a, a fine motion, very well written. Um, my question is for the technical folks, and you know, we use words in there, unauthorized harvest, well publicized, is there Diagnostic evidence in our stock assessment, uh, diagnostic anomalies that could be attributed to missing catch. <clears throat> They're debating who's going to tackle <laughs> this one. And it looks like Jason's the winner. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Katie and I are just discussing, I was trying to get, I've looked at probably, I don't know, a thousand retrospective analyses over the past couple mm -hmm. of weeks, so 
I was trying to figure out which one this was. So there, there's a small retrospective. Um, it's not, in the grand scheme of fisheries, it's not uh, a severe retrospective at all. So <clears throat> um, I guess diagnostically, we're not seeing anything that's saying we're missing vast quantities of catch. Um, that being said, you know, we could be aliasing it in the natural mortality or something like that. So we're accounting for the mortality, just not appropriately. So um, as far as, you know, anything we can point to and say, oh, there's missing catch, it, you know, mm -hmm. there's a diagnostic that indicates that there's, there's nothing very dramatic that we can point to. I to follow up, Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to get a sense of how many how many fish we're chasing here that we think are missing versus how many we have in, in hand and what the cost benefit you know, of doing that is. But I don't necessarily oppose the motion. I just don't have a sense um, or any kind of evidence to really hang my hat on that this is a big enough problem to undermine undermine the stock assessment. But I guess we don't know, or maybe that will come out in, in, in this uh, comes I think that's the hope is that we get more information to inform us about that. Mr. Fodi. Yes, as of with other species, uh, the Philadelphia area is basically a harbinger of a lot of illegal fish and size limits and everything else. And I know Phil, uh, Pennsylvania doesn't sit on, on this board, but maybe they should be part of the discussion. I know we had that problem with striped bass and, if, you know, illegally coming out of New Jersey going into the Philly market. So we should basically look at how that affects there and try to get some. When we checked them out, I remember years ago, we actually checked out the market and we found a whole bunch of illegal fish coming in, into the, those markets. Okay, seeing no further hands up, let me ask, is there any objection to this motion? Seeing none, the motion carries. All right, that brings us to the conclusion of the agenda. Is Mr. Simpson, you'd like to add something? Yeah. Um, uh, so again, for the PID, and, and um, it, it seems we've talked about Long Island Sound um, issues and stock assessments. The board's aware that, that there is work beginning on a Long Island Sound stock assessment. So I think if, if that is the inclination of, of the board to entertain a, a you know, at a, at a future date in the next year or two, perhaps a Long Island Sound assessment, I think knowledge of that would be important to have in here and maybe get some reaction to peop to, uh, from the public. I think it helps inform decisions about where you group, where you stick Connecticut as the problem has been, has been portrayed. Um, because my, my effort in the motion was to minimize disruption. You know, if we're with New York and New Jersey, then, then we minimize disruption among states. If we're with Rhode Island and Massachusetts, uh, and then we have to be lumped with New York, we're, we're disrupting more states. So I think just that notion of a stock assessment coming, and I'm getting the sense that the board is okay with that, um, if that were to be included, I think it would, I think it would help the, the amendment process uh, considerably. Anything else the board wants to bring to the PDT? Mr. Foti? Yeah, thinking of what Dave just said, I mean, whether you disrupt one end or the other disruption is, more, is basically not the real problem. The real problem is whether we should have a separate management zone for Long Island Sound. And maybe that's an answer to the question. I mean, I always sit around here and say we should have these regions based on what it is. And of course, it's a lot of consternation by the, the state directors to actually split up states. But maybe we should ask the public how they feel about that. To, if this Long Island Sound should have spe special regulations that are basically on the, based on the stock assessment of Long Island Sound. Because that's a great starting place to do that. I mean, we all. I've, I've lived on Long Island, I've fished on Long Island, and realized that it's a whole different area, ecosystem, whether it's lobsters, whether it's, it's, it's uh, Menhaden, whether it's uh, to talk. So maybe we should ask that question because it's a perfect place to do that. Okay, and again, just a reminder that Tony has requested members for the PDT as well. <coughs> Mr. 
we'd also need to discuss moving forward population of this subcommittee in the coming weeks, correct? If it's okay with the board, um, we can work with Adam and Jim as chair and vice chair of the board, and I'll work with the law enforcement committee on who to populate um, this subgroup with, and we'll um, move forward. Seeing no objection, just a couple thumbs up around the table. Sounds good. All right, so let me also uh, thank Melissa for all her help here on this board. This will be her last board meeting, so I appreciate all her help, both as a fisherman and as acting chair. And we wish you the best. Okay. Tom? I will also like to thank Steve for all this time he's put in because this is his last official meeting on the board or of any of the boards of the Atlantic States and wish him well in his, his new endeavors and just have a good time in retirement. Thank you, Steve. Mr. Chairman, move to adjourn. <laughs> any objections? Seeing none, the board is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much.